Today is November 17th, 2006. We're at the home of Mr. Lauren Bruns in Loveland, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm with the Northern Colorado Veterans Oral History Project. Good afternoon, Mr. Bruns. Good, good afternoon. Thank you very much for participating in this program. Well, I, uh, I'm very happy to do so. I, I'm blind and and so uh, it's kind of hard for me to, uh, I just go by memory on all my th happenings. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll just do it as best we can. Let's start out, uh, if you could tell us when and where you were born. I was born in 1920, June the 25th. And I was born in Republic County, Kansas. The county seat was Belleville, Kansas. Okay. How many? Uh, uh, how many? Tell us. Can you tell us a little bit about your parents and and how many siblings you had? Yeah. And I had uh, parents. My dad's name was Fred Bruns, and my mother's name was Minnie Bruns. And I had one sister that was younger than me. She was born two years later after I was born. Okay. Well, tell me a, a little bit about what you were doing prior to joining the service. Well, I, uh, for one thing, was my dad was in the service during the First World War, and the reason I'm mentioning this is because it'll tie in later with some of the activities that I had. But anyway, I always enjoyed putting on his uniform when I was a kid, quite young, probably about seven, eight. And he taught me all the facings, uh, the army, all of the, just everything about how to report to a captain and all that stuff. So anyway, then as time went on, I loved baseball. We lived on the farm. But I just love baseball, and I won't go in detail on my baseball career. But but I uh, then the first thing I knew, here it was, Pearl Harbor. And when Pearl Harbor hit, why being my name was Bruns, why I was practically on the first names to be drafted. So about February of 1942, why I was called by the draft board to come in for a physical, a county physical, and I had broken my ankle the summer before, and they examined it and it wasn't quite healed ready, so they gave me a six months deferment. So that would take me up until the latter part of 42, probably about oh, uh, September, October. Well then, in the meantime, I had a friend that, that was going to be called in the service right away. And so he decided to join the Marines. And so while he was in the Marines, why two of his brothers and a couple of us, others, we decided we'd go out and see him out in San Diego after he was there about two, three months. And so we headed out to San Diego and we were never away from home. So this is all new and we didn't want to go into San Diego. So we pulled out southeast of San Diego and we got in some bare ground out there, and I think it was a training grounds for the Marines. And we we got went through a gate, and the guard was gone. So we went on through and drove right up to the docks, and the, all the battleships were docked out there. And they there must have been, oh, I don't know, half a dozen or more big ships. And so two of the guys got out 
and started to take pictures of the battleships. And in the meantime, I guess the guard woke up and he radioed in and, and said we had sneaked in. And so here come a squad car, about four motorcycles, loaded the two guys that had the cameras in the squad car and the rest of we had to follow and they with the car and they escorted us with a couple of motorcycles and we went into San Diego and as we were going through the gate of the of the marine base or what had a big sign that read Ten thousand dollar fine, five years imprisonment. Oh, jeez! For having a camera inside this base, and so we still didn't realize how much trouble we were in. But anyway, they pulled us in and locked us up, and they considered us as spies. We were all German. The names were like Otto, Martin, Adolf you know, all German names. We were from a German community, farming community. But anyway, they questioned the two guys with the cameras all day. And this was on Saturday. And of course we had told them that we had come there to see this one guy's brother. But that didn't make any difference. And so, they, they held us there and told us that they, that they have to wait for a report from Nebraska, from the FBI, before they could do anything with us one way or another. So about evening, they got a report back from Nebraska and said that we were just farm boys and that we had a clean record and that we weren't uh, considered any danger to the... But anyway, then they got a hold of the, the boy in the, Marine, in the Marines and so we met with him for about a, oh, an hour and then they told us to get in the car and head back to Nebraska as fast as we could. <laughs> and so, but anyway, that was our experience of being a spy. And I guess it was in the Omaha World Herald that they had caught spies on the West Coast. But anyway, San Diego at the time was covered with balloons, with cables, and it was really wartime stuff. And like I say, it was about July of 1942, and it was right in the thick of it, where it was, wasn't safe from enemy aircraft. And anyway, we got, we got back home, and I waited my, my draft, and I got drafted then in, I think it was November, and I went into the service at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. And we were there about two days. I passed my physical and everything. And then we left there and went to Camp McCain, Mississippi for our basic training. And as we were leaving, why, on the train, one guy got off the train and this was in December, it was cold, and he took all his clothes off and stood outside the train naked. So that was our first casualty. Anyway, he was left behind. So as we went on with our training, everything went fine. Our officers were very nice and everything and so we started our training and so they started to teach us uh, how to do all of the, the different uh, steps and so forth and well anyway the 
Uh, I knew all of the basic things like, oh, they're about face, right face, and all that stuff. I knew that real well. And the officers were quite surprised that I knew all that stuff. And so we were in the orderly, in the, in the classroom, and the orderly come in and said that the captain wanted to see me. So we went, I went in, I knocked on the door like my dad told me, walked up to the captain, saluted him, just like I was a veteran. And so he asked me, he said, uh, where did you have military training at before? And I said, none, sir. And I was taught from dad that I always said, no, sir, or yes, sir. And so I said, none, sir. And he asked me three, four times, and I always answered him the same way. I never did tell him that my dad taught me all that stuff. So anyway, he let me go. Day or so later, we had some other things like a pivot man on how to do the pivot on pivot and column left and column right and half column left and all that stuff. Well, I had that down pat. So anyway, then, then he, one of the officers said, front and center. Well, it, we had never had anything like that, so I just walked up, did an about face, and walked up even with him and did the right face, walked up to him, saluted him. And they never said a word. Then they told me that was all, so I did the about face, went back and got back in line. And the first thing I knew, the captain called me in again. <laughs> <laughs> And so he asked me, he said, now you tell me, where did you have military training at before? I said, none, sir. And well, he thought I was lying to him. And so I never did tell him, never did. And so then he said, well, he said, I'll tell you what, he said, we're short of cadre here. And he said, we're going to make you a, a uh, non, an, an acting squad leader. So he put a band on my arm and I was acting squad leader. Huh. They couldn't give me a rating because I wasn't just start basic. So anyway, as it went on, I knew more stuff. He called me in again. He said, you know, we've changed our mind that we're not going to wait until you finish basic training. We're going to give you a corporal's reading now. And I was in the Army about two weeks then. I'll be there. So anyway, I was a corporal, and I went through basic, rough basic, because there were a lot of stuff that I didn't know. And I had to learn the hard way. And a lot of the sergeants and non-coms I got a lot of the dirty duties because uh, they'd give me the care of the quarters and stuff like that, that they could, I wouldn't turn down, you know. So when it was all right, so I had a pretty rough basic training. And as we went through about yeah, three months, why we, we were, about ready, they told us that we'd get home, go home for a week or ten days for a furlough after we finished basic training. Well, anyway, uh, that didn't happen. So we joined the 45th Division, and the 45th Division had to leave right away. And so we we left there then, no furlough. But as we went on a train through, went through Washington, D.C., all the lights and everything, it was the first time that I started to get a little homesick. Hmm. And I just felt kind of bad because I didn't get to go home. And a lot of them didn't. They felt bad. Well, anyway, so we went to Camp Shanks, New York, 
that was the port of debarkation. And, and of course, when you're there, you're on call any time to leave. So we did get to go in one day into New York, and I went to see a ball game at the Yankee Stadium. Well, so what was what was that like? A, a, a Kansas farm boy in the big city, in, you know, New York City. Oh, seeing a professional I was really game. lost. Yeah. And I was with another kid. Was practically the same boat I was in. You know, he didn't. He'd never been away from home. But the people were so nice in New York. They helped us, you know, all through the. Uh, through all of the stations and everything, what to take and how to get there and everything so forth. So they were all real good about that. And so went back to camp. And of course we left shortly in a day or two. And we boarded a, a, a ramp, or not a ramp, but a, a float and put the whole company on this float and went down the Hudson River to our ship. Went past like 42nd Street and different places. And we loaded the ship and then we left right quick. Some of the ships left from Newport News and I still don't know today where that's at. <laughs> down in Virginia. Well anyway, some of them left from there. So then as we left, we followed the coastline down and at the further we went, why the more ships joined us. And as we got about one day out, well, we had a big convoy. Well, then we, we reached, we got out, I don't know where it was exactly, it was southeast towards Cuba or somewhere. <laughs> but anyway, the submarines were quite thick. German wolf pack, they called them, I think. And they were sinking ships right and left. But anyway, we run into a wolf pack and these, the destroyers were dropping big barrels right next to our ship in the water and they'd go down, I don't know how deep, and then they'd explode. And it shook the ship pretty good. <laughs> and I guess uh, the Germans were right in the convoy, the submarines. And so we were delayed for a couple days. I think normally they said it would take about 10 days to go from New York to Africa. But anyway, were you, were you worried at all about being sunk by a sub? Did that? Were you... No, I didn't seem to really worry too much. I was so sick. <laughs> well, that's what. That's my next question. I want to ask. I've heard so many stories about the Atlantic crossing from guys, and they always seem to tell the same story. Give me a, a Kansas farm boy's perspective of crossing the ocean on a ship and how that went. That was terrible. And I tell you, it was an old ship we were on. And the, that old rudder made a noise like it was about ready to wear out. And they told us, they told us that if a ship got strayed off from the convoy, that was just a lost ship, because the, the submarine would sink it off right away. And so that was our only worry. But I was thinking about in the meantime, I was sicker than a dog. And every time I wanted to go eat, they said, well, if you get, get to eat, if you eat something, it'll be better. So I got to the mess hall, and then everybody was throwing up at the table where they were standing eating. Some were puking out of portholes, and, and that just turned me right around again. For right, at least five days, I didn't eat a thing, and I didn't have anything left in my stomach either. <laughs> uh. And so, we finally got to Oran, Africa, and it was just like going from heaven to hell. I mean, the odor was bad, and it just, it, it 
just wasn't good. Because they had sunk a lot of ships in that harbor, too, of ours. And, but anyway, so we went east of Oran, approximately, I had to guess, and it was 30 or 50 miles. And so we did our training there. I mean, a lot of our advanced training that we didn't have in the States. We had some pretty rugged training in the States, but it wasn't like what we were getting into there. And up to then, well, we had lost a lot of men that, well, they climb up on high ramps on obstacle courses and then climb down the ropes on the other side and they'd freeze up there. Of course, they immediately were disqualified from belonging to our company. And that, that's how we lost a lot of our men because they, they couldn't stand under press or, you know, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So anyway, then one of the obstacle courses that we had was a tunnel. It was about two foot square made of wood. It was probably about a block and a half long, I'm just guessing. And it was just big enough for you to crawl in. I was a pretty good sized guy and with a combat pack and everything. Why well, it was all you could do was squeeze in there. Hmm. And we went in there one right after the other, kick up dirt, you couldn't hardly breathe. And then the guy, would, you'd hear a guy say, I got my pack caught or I got this caught because the, the tunnel that was made was pretty rugged. And so you were under a lot of how to control yourself. I know that a lot of our guys that didn't make it back in the States would have froze in that tunnel. And there they'd be wouldn't move. Hmm. Well, we finally got through it. Man, that was a good feeling. So then, got through that, and then we had to go through, a, which we had done before, is where you jump across the water hole with the ropes and stuff. Well, anyway, the guy, not in front of me, but the guy in front of the other guy in front of me, had his had his, um, um, all the, the, uh, oh, what do you call it? You stick on the rifle. Bayonet. Bayonet. He had stuck it on the rifle and he swung across this, on the ropes, and as he swung across, it fell off his shoulder and went straight back into the guy in front of me and run the, the bayonet right through his leg, right below his, his groin. Huh. And it went through, just missed a bone, went straight through, got him down. I remember when the medics was there or what, but we run them. Every one of us carried morphine, uh, in these little packets uh -huh. in uh, gauze and stuck that in that hole and pushed it through, pushed it through the hole and then they they got, he went to the hospital hmm. wherever he went. Yeah. But anyway that gauze through that hole helped disinfect it. And so then we had, well, we did a lot of marching and what have you there. Well, anyway, then we took some amphibious training where we got on ship and then had to go down on ropes into a Higgin boat for landing. Mm -hmm. And then they'd make a circle. They'd make a circle and land somewhere in the vicinity. But anyway, I was the first one, because I was, had squad number one and a 
first section of the first platoon. So I was always in front most of the time. So I stood next to the ramp. We couldn't look out because the, the Higgins boat was too tall. And as they let down the ramp, as I was getting ready to walk off of it, who did I bump into? General Patton. Is that right? And he said, asked me where I was from in the States. And he had his Jeep and his dog with him and the driver. And he was real nice. He could be a lot tougher. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't have any reason to be. But anyway, that was, I met my first general. <laughs> I'll be darned. And um, so anyway, so then we we did some other training, and then we got ready. The fourth on the first night out on guard duty, we had one guard out. When they went to relieve him, he was dead and didn't have any clothes left on him. Huh. The Arab killed him and took his clothes. Huh. So then after that we put two men on guard. Wow. So then then we as we went on we got ready to uh, board. Oh and by the way the chaplain told another guy and myself he said you know Sicily was just taken yesterday so we know we're not going to Sicily. And um well, we were told back in New York in the squad room that our first stop would be non-combat and our second stop would be combat. So anyway, uh, so we figured, well, at that time, heck, I didn't know where Sicily was or anything, you know. But anyway, so, so every word got around that Sicily was taken, so we knew we weren't going there. So we boarded ship at night. They left the trucks with lights on, driving lights, so that it couldn't be seen from the air. And we pulled into the port and loaded onto the ship. I guess it was several ships. And we took off. We were on the Mediterranean when it got daylight. And we headed down the Mediterranean east toward Algiers. And in there, and, and that evening, it was just about dark, we passed Malta. So we knew then that we weren't going to Sicily, that it had to be probably Yugoslavia. So anyway, as, as it got dark, the whole convoy turned around and turned around and headed towards Sicily. And by that time, the storm had come up. I mean, a bad one, a lot of wind, high sea. I mean, it was really rugged. The water was splashing up on the deck. Did, did you get sick as well on this trip? Well, I wasn't sick then. I wasn't sick then. But, but anyway, we got, we got all ready, had all our gear. We had to wear goggles going in. And, and of course, a gas mask. And the reason we had to wear goggles because they would, thought the Germans might use gas. So we had, and the gas that they used would blind you instantly. Hmm. And so uh, we wore these goggles and we had our gas mask and we were geared with hand grenades and some of the guys were loaded down with, with uh, bazooka ammunition and bazooka. And that was about the only real ammunition we had was bazookas. But anyway, so
So we started to get on deck, and like I say, the the Higgin boats were floating right up level with the deck, and then they dropped about 20 feet. Hmm. And we were just ready to load, and we had lost our balloon on top of the, this is all what we were told. Uh -huh. We lost the balloon above the ship due to the heavy wind with the cable. So we were free picking for aircraft. Well anyway, just as we were getting ready to load in the Higgin boat, here's come a dive bomber flying real low coming right at our ship and he dropped a couple uh, uh, I guess they were uh, oh, what do you call them? Torpedoes? Torpedoes. Yeah. They hit our ship I guess knocked a couple holes in it, a couple decks. Well anyway so the minute they went across, man, they seemed like they were flying 10 feet above our heads. Oh, jeez. So when they would run back and grab the pipe and down the pipe we went, down below. So then we got back when the aircraft seemed to, well, then the ship, like I say, this was dark. And it was probably about 4 o'clock in the morning. And... I don't know, I'm just guessing, but it, yeah. it's dark. But anyway, we started to get back on deck again, ready to load again. And you'd wait till the Higgin boat got up, even with the deck, and then you'd jump in. And if you got caught between the net and the boat, you were a goner. So, it was a matter of timing to jump in the boat. And we started out, and there's 38 men to a boat team. We found that out earlier in Africa. Then there was like three squads or four. But anyway, we started out, and I mean to tell you it was a rough one. But in, oh, and by the way, the ship, thought it was going to sink. Hmm. So we were, see, we were supposed to land in our Higgin boats at six miles out and then go in from there. But I guess they thought the ship might sink from being hit. They headed it in towards shore. We got within about two miles of shore and uh, the artillery opened up on us, the German artillery. And so they were dropping eggs all around us. And the ship, oh, the skipper, he kept zigzagging around like that. And then we finally got into our Higgin boat. And as we went in, we were all sick. I mean, we were throwing up over everybody. And then we were supposed to land at, if I can remember right, I think we were supposed to land at Yellow Beach, Yellow Two Beach. Well, the frogmen are went in earlier ahead of us. They signaled back and said we couldn't land there on the kind of rocks coil reef rocks. So we had to land a short distance from there. And we had to land out away from the coast because they would just take the Higgin boat and just set it on shore if you got too close. So they dumped us out. We had to practically swim our way out from the Higgin boat. And you had, you had your hats on and such then, oh, too. Oh, yeah. 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 But, but, the bad, but the bad part of it was nearly all of the ammunition on the bazookas all got wet. Oh. 
and it wouldn't fire. And our big enemy was the tanks, German tanks. Well, anyway, the Navy knocked out, we heard later, about 35 tanks. They knocked out over our heads. And they had the our troops put pretty close to shore. And of course, you couldn't land any supplies because the ocean was so rough. So we didn't have any supplies the first day at all. And but anyway, we had prisoners galore. <laughs> we had about 1,700 prisoners. And there were about 20 of us. 300 of them were Germans. Now, with your German ancestry, were you, did you speak German? Were you able to talk with yeah, them? Yeah, I talked to them. Yeah. And so one That's of the guys, the German guys, asked me, said, where did you learn German? And I said, well, where did you learn English? And he told me in England. I guess a lot of them went to school in England. But anyway, this was a little older guy. I mean, 30 probably. But the young ones, 19-year-olds, they were mean devils. And they would even do the goose step while you had them there. And we just loaded them down with heavy equipment, what we could find. And but anyway, you couldn't trust them at all. So anyway, I think it now it must have been about the first day. We had these 17, roughly 1,700 prisoners. And we took them up along the beach. Took them up along the beach and I knew I was walking close to water that dropped off about 50 feet. They could have very easily have just pushed me in, <laughs> yeah. but but the uh, Italians, it was just a good thing they weren't all Germans, or I wouldn't be here today probably. But anyway, the Italians, they were they were ready to give up, and so. That was a big help. And as we went along the coast, why, uh, we had a machine gun or something in the rear end with the German prisoners. They tried to break for it or something, I know. They got fired at a couple times with rapid fire. I don't know what they hit or what they did, I don't know. But anyway, we went on. We got close to Scogletti. And there was a flat area about probably a quarter of a mile long at least. We were there and all of a sudden we heard a roar of planes. I mean it was really a, and the Navy opened up on them and the darndest fireworks you ever seen in your life. And what it was turned out to be the 82nd Airborne, and they flew right over the Navy, and as they flew over the Navy, German planes were up above them and dropped bombs down through them, so the Navy thought it was Germans. Hmm. So they opened up, and they were knocking planes out of the sky like flies, and you could hear, you could hear People drop out in the water and, and gliders and oh, what have you. And at the same time, they were firing right over our heads because the planes were flying at about 300 feet off the ground. Hmm. Now, I talked to a jump master the next day. He was the only one that got out of the plane. He said he stood in ready to give orders to jump. And he said... Uh, a uh, shell went right through his plane, so he just fell out. Mm -hmm. Now, at flying at 300 feet or a little more, 
you could make one swing and then you'd hit the ground. Because they had to do that at that airfield that they were supposed to take 20 miles inland. But they didn't get there because they thought when they went over our Navy that that was any aircraft firing from the airfield. And they all jumped out. Hmm. And so there were a lot of broken bones and people that never, shoots never opened. It was really a mess. And I read in the Reader's Digest some years later that the 82nd Airborne lost 600 men on that. And I think they lost more than that. Because I was with this captain, he said we got wiped out completely. Wow! Did you when you guys landed on the beach? Did you guys take any casualties? Your uh, your group? Yeah. Yeah. Was it pretty pretty rough fighting? Yeah, it was. Uh, it wasn't bad. Like I say, most of them were Italians. Oh, okay. So we had it a lot better. Yeah. And. Uh, but the, the infantry was right with us because the line was right, right, because the Navy was firing right over our heads. And they did that all day. Man, I bet there were some barrels of the, of the, the big guns. What did that sound like? Oh, uh, the, boy. Popping off in the, in the shell going over you. I didn't go to any fireworks here in the United States ever. Because I've seen all the fireworks I wanted to see. I mean, talk about firepower. Huh. Holy mackerel. And so anyway, well, then we, we finally got organized again. Now... There were some times in there it seemed like I passed out and didn't know where I was or what happened. But anyway, the next thing I knew, well, the next thing that happened was we were, there were about 30 of our company all in a group. We finally got together some way. So the captain told we hadn't slept for a couple of days or more. And he said, I want you to lay down here in these weeds and take a nap, but be ready to go at any time. Well, another guy and I decided, you know, being all in that one big bunch laying there, one hand grenade would just about wipe us out. Huh. <laughs> so anyway, we went just a little bit further away, no, not far, maybe 20 feet. Well, not having slept for so long, when we knocked out, I mean, we were out cold. And when we woke up, it was just uh, getting dark. It wasn't dark yet, but everybody was gone. This guy and I were all alone. Hmm. Nobody in sight. Nowhere. And finally we seen two guys. And they were Canadians. And they joined us two. And we found a Higgin boat. And we got in this Higgin boat, and it must have been full of gas because, man, it run all night. We, just as it got dark, we started out with that Higgin boat. You know, you know what a, you know what a, it's like a boat, but right, it'll, yeah, flat yeah, bottom. You know, uh, it'll go in water too. Yeah. So anyway, we started out, and we had more got started, and we got fired on. And I mean, they just rattled our old vehicle like metal. We jumped out and fell in a ditch. We were on this little dirt road. 
we laid there for about an hour or so. Everything quieted down. We never fired a shot, because if we did, we'd have been in trouble. So anyway, after everything quieted down, we got back on our Higgin boat and started driving again. And about a quarter of a mile or half a mile away, down in the bottom in the belly, there were fireworks down there at Dover. The infantry was really at it. So anyway, say, excuse me, could we turn it off for just a second? Well, we, we started out again with our hoop and any, and we crept along pretty easy, pretty slow. We were on the other side of the mountain, or hill, there wasn't a mountain, it was a hill. And right below us is where all the fireworks was going on. And as we went on, we finally, when it got daybreak, that night seemed like it went awful fast. And we got close to a junction a road, and it was a good road. It was almost like an oil road. And as I looked around to our side, there were GIs crawling in the weeds, in the grass, unrolling wire, signal core. And so instead of turning south, we turned it north which was a bad deal. We turned north, and as we went north about a half a mile, why right across our front come one of our planes and start strafing right in front of us, right to our right. Thinking you were enemy? No, they weren't firing at us. Oh. They, they went across the road and hit hit the enemy in the trees there. There was a pretty heavy wooded area and they were firing away in there. And so then after it was over with, well, we could hear people talking and I thought I could hear some Germans talking. But I couldn't tell what they were saying. And so I told the guys, I said, you know what? I said, I think we're in hot water. We better get this thing turned around and head south. And so we did, and I think the only reason they never fired at us was they didn't want to give away their position. But anyway, we were right in practically behind the line. <laughs> uh -huh. So anyway, we went quite a ways past that road that we come off of, we got up there on top of the kind of a knoll, and here was a combat MP. And boy, he gave us hell. He said, where in the hell have you guys been? He said, you know that you're in a combat zone? And well, we had realized that. <laughs> huh. So he said, get right, go south just as fast as you can go. We went just a little ways, and here we met the tanks, the American tanks. That's the first time they come aboard. They were big rascals. And once the tanks got in there, troops, ground troops, don't like tanks. And I think they hightailed it as fast as they could. But anyway, we went by the tanks and then we finally found my company uh, with, and they had all re reported us as missing in action. <laughs> <laughs> and, but anyway then, we wondered what in the world next. So anyway, then, they said they needed three, three guys to operate cranes 
on one of the Liberty ships. They didn't have anybody to unload stuff. Oh yeah, we were farmers. We knew how to handle the hydraulic stuff. And to get away from that darn beachhead, that would be better than, you know. But we got out there, we were out there almost a day, and I'll tell you what, we were glad to get out of there. That's worse place than being on the beach. Why is that? Oh man, they, the planes were coming in there just a few at a time, you know, attacking the ships. And, well anyway, heck, none of us knew how to operate these big cranes. Cripe, you'd be clear up there in the, if the what they call the, what is it, the scarecrow? Uh, anyway, it was up there like 50, 60 feet in the air. And that's where they operate the crane. And we had to unload trucks out of the hatches. And I'll tell you what, once you got the trucks hooked up, you wouldn't want to be in there because you'd get killed. <laughs> get killed. <laughs> I'll tell you what. We had trucks swinging from one end to the other. <laughs> and, and boy, I'll tell you what, there wasn't no, I don't think there was anything left on it that would break. And loading them in the Higgin boat was like, or a, one of those rafts, like a boat, like a Higgin boat, they were bigger. And, and boy, we took the first ride back into the, <laughs> to the beach <laughs> and so well anyway then we got uh, close to an area where we had they had piled big piles of of artillery shells and these crates artillery shells they weighed like well well over a hundred pounds each and they had 105s and 155s in them. And they were made of wood. And there was a pile there probably, oh, 10 feet high and probably 20 feet long and about that wide. And it was all artillery shells. Well, anyway, here come a plane in, we always, They'd always come in one at a time and strafe us. Here come a plane, I didn't hear it coming. And, because there was something running. The other guys, they went on over the sandbar, wherever it was. Well anyway, I was close to this pile of ammunition, of artillery shells, and that plane come in there and hit that pile of artillery shells square on, just buried itself right in there. I mean there was stuff flying all over and I was, I was next to it. I was just lucky I didn't get hit by anything. And so then I, first thing I thought about was, there was a lot of smoke it was from the plane. First thing I thought about was to get to get the pilot out of there. So I crawled up to the pile of and he was buried right in the middle of that stack. Oh the plane the plane crashed into the stack? Yeah. Oh. Right in it. I mean he just dug a hole right in there and stopped him almost in his tracks. It's just like hitting a wall, you know. Yeah. And the plane was smoking, and the guys knew I was in there, so they hollered at me to see if I was alive, and I hollered back. And so I crawled up to the fuselage of the plane. It was laying practically flat on, flat on the ground. And the pilot, his head was hanging over, and grease was just dripping from his head. 
and I opened up his shirt and it just seemed like he was dead. The dog tags were buried in his flesh from where he was burnt. I had to scrape off the flesh off of the dog tags to see whether whether it was an American or, you know. Uh -huh. And I got it cleaned off and it was uh, Lieutenant Goldberg from Buffalo, New York. It was one of our own, uh. one of our own planes. Uh. He'd come in there and try to make a crash landing. And anyway, they were hollering at me to get out of there because they thought the whole thing was going to blow sky high. Yeah. And I tried to unstrap the straps where he was fastened because I was going to get a hold of him and pull him out of there. I thought if things would blow up, there wouldn't be anything left of him. And if it did, I wouldn't either, <laughs> you know. But anyway, you never think about those things at the time. Yeah. So anyway, I I crawled out of there and I, I told the guys, I said, I think he's dead. I really do. Because he just burned terrible. Well, anyway... You know that I passed out, and I still don't know today what happened to the pilot. Huh. I don't know if he lived. I don't know how they got him out of there. I'm sure the Navy come and got him off of aircraft carrier. But I passed out and don't remember anything. Huh except what happened up to that point. Mm -hmm. And so I often wondered, our grandson got married in Annapolis and we were staying there right close to, to the school. And I wish I'd have had somebody, I was blind then already, I wish I'd have had somebody go in and check and see if if he was on the list of deceased, you know? Yeah. Because chances are he probably was a graduate of Annapolis. You yeah. Know? I, he couldn't have been. He might have not been. But anyway, so anyway, that happened and uh, things went black. And I didn't remember anything until we pulled out of there and we were north of the beach head a ways close to a town named Gila and the company commander got me to take two guys and go on patrol to see if there's any Germans left in that little village and that's when that picture was taken of three of us Okay, uh-huh. We went into a shop there and he asked if he wanted our picture taken. Yeah. But of course we couldn't wait, you know, around for the to get the so about a couple of weeks later one of our lieutenants happened to go back into that town. So I asked him if he could stop there and find out if and he did. And that's what I got. And, uh, but anyway, we didn't find any Germans, or they didn't find us. But uh, then that night we got hit real hard by German planes. I know one, one bomb hit a tree right next to where I was, close by, about 100 feet. And the shrapnel went into a tree right where I was. I had dug a hole. We had to dig our uh, fox hole enough to get level with the ground anyway. And that 
chunk of shrapnel was about the big as your head and it was stuck into that tree about 10 inches from the bottom and that was at least not more than two three feet from where I was laying. Hmm, wow. So it was just one close shave after another. But anyway, so we then Patton finally decided he didn't want to listen to Montgomery anymore. They didn't get along anyway. So Patton pulled, we were supposed to support his left flank, Montgomery, as he went up the coastline up to Messina, I think it is. And that's where it went across over into Italy. But anyway, so Patton decided to head for Palermo, which is just the opposite direction of where. Huh. And uh, well, anyway, Bradley was with us too, because I remember him, General Bradley. And we got up close to Palermo. And as we went, the tanks were ahead of us. And they were knocking out tanks because they were still burning when we went by them. But anyway, we got into Palermo on the west end. It was kind of a valley in there. And we stopped there for the night. And about daybreak in the morning, somebody had started a fire close to our area. I'm sure it was probably a civilian. And here come, now we were told this, that 23 planes crashed against the mountain. They were all dive bombers. And they hit us, I mean hit us hard. Well anyway, where I, I'd been around enough where if I'd hear a bomb drop, I could tell by the way it sounded how close it was going to be. If it whistled, you didn't have to worry. But if it fluttered, it was right above you. Well, I heard this flutter and I took off and sure enough the bomb lit right close to where I was and hit a truck and disabled it I guess but anyway then I went over a wall they had houses had walls about six eight foot high with glass on top well, I went over the wall. I didn't cut myself anyway. There were shards of glass on, on the top? Yeah. Oh, geez. And I crawled along the wall, and the bombs were dropping, and the wall was shaking like mad. And I crawled in a hole with a family. They had two little kids. They were like, two and five probably and I held one of them and it's, it's I never forget that poor family they had a beautiful home there and I probably should have never gone inside there because that was kind of against the rules you know, about going into somebody's property. But boy, when it's a matter of life and death, you do anything. So anyway, they were real nice and they, then I got back out and I had a heck of a time getting back over that wall. I went over it pretty easy because I was in a hurry. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so then, then we went into Palermo, and it was just uh, 
one thing after another. We had a job of checking out ships on the in the port, which was bomb terrible. Only one vehicle could go get in there at a time. And they were unloading supplies there. And when the when the they had a 90 that they'd fire whenever there was an air raid. And the trucks would all head for that one opening. And <laughs> the darndest crashing noise you ever heard in your life. <laughs> and they were all black drivers, most of them. Truck companies, you know. Yeah. And <laughs> I'll tell you what. I don't think there was much left of those trucks when they got through. And, but anyway, because everybody headed for that one hole. But, uh, but anyway, then uh, I, uh, uh, things got, then I, then I, I got, we went into this depot company and we worked there for a while. And so then I met a sergeant. They had a, 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 a Piper Cub uh, squadron. What it was, it was Piper Cubs, two-seater, one behind the other one. And they were spotters for air, for artillery. And I met this sergeant over there and he said, come over someday and I'll give you a ride. So I went over one afternoon. I went over there and he said, you know what? I got real busy and I, he said, I can't do it today. But he says, I'll tell you what, I think I know someone that will take you up. And so he got him and it was a captain. So he took me up and Flew all over Palermo, all every place, and when we come back to land, he scared the crap out of me. Headed for a hedgerow, and he turned around and he said, we're not going to make it. <laughs> and he just whoosh, went straight up. Boy, I'll tell you what, if I'd have been loaded, I'd have crapped my pants. <laughs> but anyway, when I got through, I was glad to get out of that plane. So then the sergeant said, do you know who took you up? I said, no. He said, Captain so-and-so, General Patton's private pilot. Huh. And he always left from there in a Piper Cup. And, but he had a plane that was enclosed, kind of like a cabin. But, um, but I wish I'd have got his name, kept his name. But anyway, it was a, he was the pilot for General Patton. He was a daredevil. Uh. And then as time went on, I got put in the hospital with a blood clot. And they couldn't get it dissolved. And they I finally wound up in General Hospital in Naples and Nap uh, Rome wasn't taken yet, Anzio was in full swing, nasty place and the front line was just north of the hospital, it was on the hill off off from the port. Well, anyway, while I was there, I was treated really nice, you know, even the guys that pushed me around in the cart called me sir all the time, and I couldn't figure out why. Well, anyway, I was listed as a lieutenant. Oh. And when I went before the board to go back to the States, because doctors come around my bed and they ask the colonel, will he be well in 120 days? If you got well in 120 days, they'd keep you. 
And he said, definitely not. So anyway, uh, then I was brought up to this board, and they called me sir. And I told them, I said, I think there's a mistake. I'm, I'm just a corporal at that time. And later on, I was a sergeant, but anyway, I was a corporal, and I told them, I said, uh, I think there was a mistake, and they said they found it, and it was a mistake. But anyway, they said I'd be waiting for a boat to go back to the States, to a hospital. So then, as I was waiting for that, I had a roommate next to me. He had a long beard. Gosh, it must have been 10 inches long. And he could talk German. So I talked to him in German. And he told me he lost his whole family in Yugoslavia. The Germans killed them all. Hmm. So he was in Italy fighting behind the lines doing sabotage work. And I, there wasn't anything wrong with him that I could tell. I think they were just hiding him. He was probably a wanted guy. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, then first thing I knew, I, they got loaded me up on a ship. And the ship was named Gibbons. And it had... 908, nine, it was just a little bit under a thousand German refugees, Jews, on it. And I was in quarters with guys from the Air Force that had finished their 50 missions going bombing over in Yugoslavia, the oil fields. Uh -huh. And I was in their quarters. But anyway, this one lady that was kind of in charge, everybody had to climb up a rope ladder to go to their quarters on the ship. They wouldn't let them go in the entrance. Here she had a long dress on. And she was a accountant. She was very famous. So anyway, were you, were you in, in any condition to climb that rope? I didn't. Yeah. No, but the the uh, the, the uh, German refugees. Oh, I see. Did. Okay. Yeah, they wouldn't let them go on it, on the main entrance. I don't know why. Probably a disease, probably. Oh, okay. But anyway, they ha she had to climb the rope too. And she come from Washington, and she worked for Roosevelt. So she was actually in charge of the refugees. And her name was Ruth Gruber. And that was my, ma my mother's maiden name was Gruber. But anyway, as we went, I read this later, it was in the Reader's Digest too, that we were followed by a German submarine all the way, and they said that, they didn't tell us that, but that we would be apt to be sunk by the Germans. But Louise read in this book that Ruth Gruber wrote that they had German prisoners in, in boats next to each, us on either side, and the Germans didn't want to fire on our ship because they're afraid they'd hit they'd hit the German prisoners. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, anyway, as we got to Oran, if we pulled in there, and as we pulled in there, we got attacked by planes, and the ship let off smoke 
from the ship and they didn't close the vents and sucked all of the smoke in our quarters and we about <laughs> suffocated huh. from smoke but it left a big cloud of smoke to let us escape out of there and we headed toward Gibraltar and then all the way back to the States and I, that's as far as I knew, but I was told that we were followed by submarines all the way. Was the crossing back to the States any better than going over? Yeah, I, I wasn't sick. Yeah. The reason was because I could eat any time I wanted. I mean, we were treated really royal, you know, really good. So was the Air Force guys. There was only about less than a hundred of us. Mm. Well, anyway, we got to New York, and boy, was it good to see the Statue of Liberty. That was a wonderful sight. And as we went through New York, they had a parade. We were in ambulances, and also the Jewish refugees. And all the street in New York City was lined with people. I don't know where they were welcoming us, couldn't hardly because there were less than a hundred of us. And I think they were welcoming back the refugees. They probably found out about it. But anyway, went to Holland General and the chaplain gave me a dollar. He said, here's a dollar, why don't you get a beer? I said, no, sir, I said, I'll tell you what I want, I want milk. Huh. Is that something you weren't able to get overseas? Yeah. yeah. Well, what little milk we got was powdered. Oh. Well, anyway, then you just couldn't get enough milk. All of us had to just drink milk, 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 milk. And uh, to heck with the beer. So I asked the uh, chaplain about this this pilot, whether I should contact his parents that I was there, you know, but I don't know whether he lived or not. Yeah. And he said, no, don't leave it alone. He said, no, he said, don't, uh, don't contact him. Because they'll have more questions for you than you can answer. They'll probably blame you for not saving his life. But anyway, then the next morning, they loaded me on a plane. And I was on a, oh, what do you call it, Jet? On a... Heck, they got a name for it, a bed um, where you laid on. Anyway, I was laying on this bed and I had my orders on my lap on the plane. So I opened it up and it said, uh, Battle Creek, Michigan, Percy General Hospital for amputation. Before, but, but anyway, uh, and I had a wonderful doctor there at, at Percy Jones in Battle Creek. And he was, a, after being there a couple of months, I found out he had, he was from Mayo's Clinic. And he saved my arm. And, but anyway, uh, so I was pretty grateful for that. And as I was there about two months, why, I got pretty restless. You know, I can't make a living, I can't get married. I can't support a family. It's 
stuff like that started to work on me. And the doctor noticed that. So he said, I think I'll have you meet Captain so-and-so this afternoon in my office. So I went, and there he was sitting at the desk with his feet on the desk. Hi, how are you? You know, just like regular Joe. And he let me know that I was the healthiest man that was there. He said, all you have to do is look around and see all these, these people with uh, amputations with legs. And I said, you're not in that bad a shape yet. And you know, I talked to him for about an hour. I started feeling quite a bit better. <laughs> so he told me, he said, I think probably you don't have enough to do. So he said, we'll figure out something. Well, then I got noticed through a recommendation that I'd been a good patient and all that stuff. And so they put me on a tour with the other amputees. And our first stop was Battle Creek, Michigan. And we were guests of Notre Dame and went to a football game. And I still have the tickets for that. Huh. They played Tulane. I don't know how it turned out. but So, so your first stop would have been South, did you, uh, South Bend, Indiana? Huh? You said uh, Battle Creek, but you were you stopped in South Bend? Yeah. Okay. At, yeah, South Bend, Indiana. Okay. Yeah. And... Uh, and then we were guests of the Elks Club for dinner. And we were guests that evening. They called them the B-12s. It was some kind of Air Force cadet training or something. They called them the B-12s. Well, anyway, we were there. They had a dance for us and had a good time. But anyway, when we got back, why they told me that that I should go downstairs, and the, the girls were down there teaching the guys how to dance. And like I say, they were up to that point. There was probably at least ninety some percent amputees. And so I went down there and I started to dance and with the gal and why she said, you really dance good, you know, for having an amputation. I never did tell her that I didn't have. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so it was pretty nice. <laughs> And um, so anyway, it was um, that was kind of a dirty trick, but and then every afternoon, why they they'd have girls come over and visit with us out on the lawn and the garden area and stuff. And then then in Battle Creek, all of the shows that went on at the nightclubs were shown at Percy Jones first. They had all of the entertainers entertain the veterans at the Percy Jones first before they entertained at the nightclubs. And I remember one of them was the famous harmonica player. I didn't know his name, but I can't remember. Boy, could he play the harmonica. Hmm. And then Michigan was kind of noted for bands. And they had, um, they had good bands there, and it seemed like music was quite a thing for 
like Michigan. And, but anyway, uh, so then um, I, uh, I went home on a furlough. They sent me home on a furlough for, I think it was 10 days or two weeks. First one I had, first time I seen my folks since I went in. Had, had you been able to keep in touch with them? Were you able oh, to write back and oh forth? Yeah, oh yeah. yeah, I kept in touch mostly with my sister. Uh huh. And, uh, but anyway, that one picture where I had a uniform on with a hat, I had that taken while I was home on furlough. And, um, and then I had orders to report to Hot Springs, Arkansas, the Arlington Hotel. And it didn't have any date when to arrive there or anything. Just go to the Arlington Hotel in Little, in, uh, let's see, that would be Little Rock. It's, it's not the, the, what, they, what they call the main, uh, yeah, that was Little Rock. Anyway, the Arlington Hotel, which was a very famous hotel, and the government took it over for the GIs, you know, for when they come back, mm -hmm. like from their hospital or wherever it might be. I know I signed up with one tour to go to Arkadelphia, Arkansas, and it was a girls' college, and. Um, they were really nice. It was they were all Baptist girls, and they had a dance, but they couldn't dance. I mean, they never did learn how. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but I was from the north, you know, and right Minnesota and Nebraska and Kansas and you know all through there. I mean, we could dance like wizards. Well, anyway. They were really nice and really enjoyed the evening with them. And they had a nice dinner for us. And so I went back and then I had orders to report to, um, to um, uh, Fort Warren, Wyoming on Christmas Day. On Christmas, no, not Christmas, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, and I took off, and, it, and I, and it didn't have any date when to arrive there either. So while I was waiting for my train in Kansas City, I was sitting on a bench, and a well-dressed guy come up to me and and asked me if I'd like to come home and have a nice Thanksgiving dinner. And I said, well, that's really nice of you. I said, but I've got to catch a train here. He said, I'll take care of that. So he took care of it. And I didn't have to leave, actually, till the next morning. So then I went home, had a beautiful home. It was a circle drive with piers all around, piers in front. It was really fancy. I think he actually worked for the Pendergrass machine. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. Famous politician in Kansas City. Yeah, and uh, anyway, uh, and of course what made it a lot nicer was their daughter was home from college for Thanksgiving. So she took me to a dance that night, Duke Ellington. Huh. And, um, which was nice. And then I heard from her for a while. But anyway, he took me around that afternoon, all the different big projects they had in Kansas City. So that's how I happened to kind of tie things together a little bit. 
that he was working for a pretty big outfit. And I know that the Pendergrass was pretty strong there. And, um, well, the reason I knew, because I had one guy in my squad that told me all about the Pendergrass machine. He was from Kansas City. But anyway, so I went to Fort Warren and and I got a job there receiving troops coming in on trains, returnees from overseas, and they'd be reassigned to different places. So we'd keep them one whole day, this other sergeant and I, I was a corporal then, but the company commander made me a sergeant because he said the, the job I had called for a sergeant. So anyway, and you know the best part of that story was we hired an orderly. I thought he was a pretty nice guy. He was older. And we had troops coming in all night. And then they take the we'd take the records and then give them a blanket and tell them where to go and what room and so forth and showed them a bed. Then and the orderly did all that. And he did such a wonderful job. He worked for, well, it was almost six months that I knew of. And when I got ready to be discharged, he come in my room and he said, Sergeant, he said, would you do me a favor? I said, yeah. He said, would you write a letter of recommendation for me? He said, I was put in the army from San Quentin. Hmm. And he said, I know a letter from you would help me a lot. And so he was released from prison and didn't know anything about it. I never looked at his records, you know? Yeah. And what we did, we'd just keep him. We wouldn't turn him in. We'd just keep his record, the ones that we want to keep, and the ones that we turned in the records for ones that were processed. So actually we had his records there and never looked at them. So that was a big surprise to me. Huh. <laughs> and um, well, in the meantime, I met a gal. She was the colonel's daughter. And she worked in the post office and I'd call down there once in a while to see if there'd been any records there yet. So anyway, on certain guys. And so she asked me one day whether I could ride a horse. And I said, no, I'd never ridden a horse in my life. I was born on a farm, so <laughs> I, I had all kinds of, I had a pony even that was on her neck. But anyway, she said, I, 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 I'll get a horse for you if you want to go riding. So she did. Went riding. One thing led to another. The first thing you knew, about three months went by, and we decided to get married. And the colonel, her dad was overseas. He had been the colonel, uh, the regimental commander there at Fort Warren before he went overseas. Of course, he didn't know anything about that, his daughter going with a sergeant. So, and he didn't really like it after he found out either. <laughs> <laughs> so then everything went along and we had, um, we had three youngsters, Rob and, and the three, Randy and no, Rich, Rich, uh, Randy and Rob, there were three R's. And being she was military, 
Well, and then I decided I wanted to live at Fort Collins because we had gone in there several times from Fort Warren. I really loved the area. So managed to, with the help from her dad, managed to buy a farm south of Fort Collins. And which is about a mile and a half north of here. Where, you know where Rest Haven is? Uh huh, yeah. Well, that was the farm. Huh. And that was in 1945, let's see, no, 46. Yeah, 46. And, well, then as time went on, I went to the, went to the county agent to find out what kind of a farm I had there. It had to be pretty bad because you wouldn't buy a farm and a tractor for $14,000. It was 148 acres, although there was a mile, a half a mile along the highway where the rest haven is now. But anyway, so I went to the county agent and so I wanted to find out what kind of land I had there and, and what I, I said, I'm broke and I've got to do something that will help pay for the farm. And so he said, well, he said, I'll tell you what you've got. You've got 90 minutes soil. I said, what do you mean by 90 minutes? He said it works good 90 minutes out of the year. <laughs> so that wasn't too good. So he said, do you know anything about dairy? I says, I don't know, just the cows. My folks had a few cows. But I said, that's all I know. Well, he said, now if you had a dairy, the because uh, Colorado doesn't have any dairies, they have to import all their milk here. And so uh, he would recommend recommend uh, a dairy. So all right, how am I going to learn about a dairy? So he recommended that I go to college and they were wonderful. They really helped me a lot. And they helped me start out and clear up to the finish. And I build up my herd when I finally quit, I was milking 60 cows. And the average was, when I first started, was a little over 100 pounds per cow, butterfat, fat. I was on Dairy Herd Improvement Association. And when I sold out, I had 513 pounds of average. Hmm. It was the largest grade herd in the state sold for the most money too. But anyway, what it was a shame that I had to quit it, but my wife was so unsettled. She always wanted to sell out the herd and go somewhere else. She just wouldn't settle down. And she just, it wasn't her life. Well, anyway, we finally got a divorce. You're not after, recording that, I hope. Huh? You're not recording that, I hope. <laughs> I can't hear you. We got a divorce, and I got the boys. The judge warned me the boys, so we batched for about three years. And in the meantime, I had sold the dairy, and I started working for the cemetery up there. They, they said I could be general superintendent there. So anyway, so I worked there and the boys and I, we batched for about three years and I got a house in town so they could walk to school. They were 7 and 11 and 13. 
and so uh, so they, they all went to different schools, but they were close, and so that helped a lot, and so that went on for a total of almost three years. Well, in the meantime, well, we knew some friends that lived there in Loveland, and and they had mentioned something to Louise. She she had come from Iowa. She had lost her husband, and so her sister-in-law wanted her to come to Loveland and start over. So she did, and she went to school in Denver and got to be a beautician, and she had her own shop in Loveland. And um, so anyway, they told her that they knew of a guy, a bad guy, that she probably would like to meet. And so anyway, uh, I guess Louise must have said yes. Well anyway, we had coffee, so I went to her house to pick her up. And her daughter was there, and she sat with me on the sofa while her mother was getting ready, because she had got home a little late from work. And so I had a, quite a visit with the daughter. The daughter was about 12. And so uh, I thought, boy, if her mom is like her daughter, she's pretty nice. And boy, when she walked out, come out of that room, oh boy. Anyway best-looking chick in London. So anyway, we went together for a couple months, and then all of a sudden she thought that the boys weren't being taken care of right, I guess. She said, so we decided to get married. And that was 44 years ago. <laughs> so we've been married 44 years. And it's been a wonderful life, and uh, and I I don't know if I forgot something that I wanted to mention, but anyway, I never made a mistake when I married her. Everybody says she's the the queen, and she's taking good care of me. And um, so anyway, that's about all I know. Okay. And I hope the, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. I think, uh, really, I just wanted to get, get your story down. I think it was a very good story. So um, I guess we'll, we'll wind down this interview. I want to I wanna thank you for uh, participating in this project. and. More importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Thank you. Well, I hope you sure don't. You can't remember the guys. Who was the one, honey, that used to come to see us? Oh, I can't remember. He's dead now. No, which which one are you in this picture? He's the, the middle, middle one. Middle one? Okay. And you got that taken at a photography studio in, in uh, Italy? Yeah, yeah, I think it was Gila. Sicily. That was in Sicily. Okay. Over the top of it. And, um... Uh, After our initial interview, um, Mr. Bruns remembered some additional information that he felt was important to add to this tape. So, Mr. Bruns, I'll let you continue with the information you'd like to add. Well, the other day when we were talking about the uh, prisoners that we were taking up to Skogletti, which is several miles up the line. Well, we had more and got started, and it was almost dark. And because uh, the days are, are pretty long then in July. But anyway, a gunshot, 
and all of a sudden the guy right next to me fell to the ground and he was standing right next to me not more than two feet from me and we didn't know we wondered what the shot was all about and he fell to the ground and what happened was he was hit by a sniper bullet and it was one of those bullets that had wood instead of lead and uh, of course I had never heard of it before and and they're not very accurate unless you're real close and he aimed at me I guess and he hit this prisoner because there's no reason why he would be want to shoot him but anyway it hit him in the chest and we pulled his shirt back and it went in into his chest and, and what it does it, it spreads out the wood in the bullet spreads out and it causes a lot of pain he was in terrific pain and and what it does it may it won't probably kill you but it'll sure lay you up for a while well anyway so we went on we left him there somebody else had to take care of me and so we went on and we went through uh, we talked about the other day on the interview about how the 82nd Airborne flew us over us about 300 feet off the ground and the Navy was shooting them out of the sky just like ducks well anyway as we got down this time uh, we took the prisoners up to a square in Skogletti. It was like uh, these towns that used to have little squares in the middle. Skogletti was a pretty small place and uh, it wasn't very big but we got all of the 1700 uh, prisoners in there to turn over to somebody else so they could take care of them. Well, as we got them in there, in this square, where the Germans attacked us and started strafing us in this square, and all the prisoners headed for the wall, uh, which I did, too, and they piled on top of me about three, four deep. Now, I remember one guy telling me in English, he said, that's okay, Joe, you'll be okay. And I was pretty well protected from bullets with about three or four deep on top of me. So then as that was over with, I don't know how many they killed or what the deal was. But anyway, we left and then the, 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 uh, another group took them over. And I don't know what they did with them. But anyway, another GI and I, this is about, probably about 2 o'clock in the morning, I would say. I it might be a little earlier than that. But anyway, we were exhausted. And as we were walking away from this little square, we noticed a church. And so we sat on the steps of this church and we dozed off, sitting there. First thing we knew, it was morning daylight. Then the next morning, I was with a captain and he was trying to find medication for all the wounded 82nd or airborne that when they when they jumped out of the plane at 300 feet well a lot of them their chutes open but they hit the ground so hard they'd break their legs and the jump master was there and I've talked to him too and he said he was in the door ready to jump 
See, they were supposed to jump out over this airfield inland about 20 miles. Well, when they went over the Navy and started shooting, they thought they were over the airfield. But anyway, he stood in the in the opening, ready to give orders to jump, and a shell went through his plane, and he just fell out. And and he survived without a without a scratch. Well, anyway, so that went on there most of the day. And we finally then joined our outfit. And then we, the next thing, why we were up in Palermo. And while we were there at Palermo, why, the reason I'm jumping clear ahead of this, because I've already covered a lot of this other stuff on my first interview. So, then they took us out east of Palermo, about 30 miles, and um, to guard a, a gasoline dump. And there were 12 of us. And when we got there, it was an apple orchard, beautiful orchard well maintained, well taken care of, and it had a, a, a rock wall or a cement wall around it, covered about, I'd say between five and ten acres. And they had all these gasoline cans stacked up underneath these trees. And if I remember right, I think the apples were still green but they were just beautiful trees. And and how they camouflaged the gas cans, they were flat, five gallon cans. And they did a wonderful job, whoever did it. But anyway, so we, I was stationed with my two guys right next, close, pretty close to the gate where it goes in and we weren't supposed to let anybody in, in the gate, and especially vehicles, because uh, if you had the tire tracks in there, they'd have to be covered up, uh, because the uh, cameras from the plane, uh, we, we called him, um, video something, can't remember. But but anyway, and so we had to maintain, make sure that nobody went in there. And we had a we had dug a hole probably about four foot deep and the three of us were in there. Then at night, the, the first night we were there, about 10.30, here, here come uh, photo, photo Jerry and we could tell when he was coming with a plane that it was a German plane because if it's more than one motor they aren't synchronized and they got a little gallop to them. It's, it's, it's different than an American plane so you could tell that it was probably photo Jerry coming or else somebody to do some harm to the depot. So he flew over. He was up fairly high. I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't low, but he dropped flares. That was another thing I couldn't figure out is how he, at night, 10.30 at night, how now, it could have been, if I remember right, it might have been full moon, too. I mean, where it was more daylight, but but how they could tell where that air, where that apple orchard was. But anyway, they dropped these flares, and then I, I guess they took pictures of the apple orchard. Well, then it went on the next night, same thing again. Here come photo Jerry. 
course, we didn't know what was going to take place, whether there's paratroopers come drop in there or, or whatever it might be. And same thing again, drop flares. And I guess he took pictures of the apple orchard. And if there had been tire tracks in there, well, then that would show up on his pictures. But anyway, that went on about three, four nights. Every night, we, we look forward to that. Uh, not really. I mean, it was kind of nerve-wracking because we didn't know for sure whether they'd come in to bomb or whether they come in to drop paratroopers or to set the thing on fire or what. But we had enough rations that they left us there. They said that we'd be there for a week. And and so we had enough uh, K rations. Well, anyone in these K rations, they had a little pack of four cigarettes in there, and the kind of terrible cigarettes. I never smoked anyway, but that's the first time that I learned to smoke. I mean, I had smoked a little bit, you know, it was just kind of a... But anyway, and these cigarettes were just taste terrible, but we'd smoke them anyway. <laughs> I forget now what they called them, but I think it was like wings or that something like that. Well, then one day we were sitting there and one of the guys said, hey, somebody's coming along the wall. He said, I see two heads bobbing. So we just, uh, we thought somebody's coming towards us. So I stood along the edge of the wall on the corner. And then as they come past the corner, well, I told them to throw up their arms. And, um, and they were Italian soldiers. They claimed they were lost from their outfit. Of course, you know, you couldn't believe them, you know. I mean, you didn't know whether they were there to sabotage the depot or what. So what are you going to do with them? We can't afford to keep them there. Couldn't shoot them. That wouldn't be very nice. So we, we called down to one of the other guards around the corner and told him to send up a guy, one man, so he could stay with, with our guy, one guy. And so uh, another guy and myself, we took the two and took them down the road. And we got to about a half a mile, we got to a little village and we wanted to look for GIs of some sort, and we finally found some lucky, uh, I don't know just what they were or what outfit they were with, but we told them that we had to get rid of these prisoners because we were guarding the depot up there and we couldn't afford to keep them with us. So they took them, and then we went back, and in about another two days, why well, they they photo Jerry quit coming over at night, and then a couple of days later, why well, they come and picked us up and took us back to Palermo, and I don't know what they. There was a lot of gasoline stored there, and uh, I don't know what they did, but. They might have had an outfit come in, trucking company, and come in and got it all right away. I don't know. But anyway, that was the end of the the uh, base depot company ordeal, or the gasoline dump. 
and it was a shame to have those those cans underneath those beautiful trees. They were really well maintained and to have them destroyed by fire or whatever it might be. But I hope it didn't happen, which I doubt. But anyway, that's the end of my story there, and I think that's about it. What I think what we can cover if you have any questions that you wanted to ask me. Yeah, I did have one question uh, in regards to after the war, you said, and you came you came home and started a dairy farm. Did you, did you take advantage of the uh, GI Bill? Uh, what was that again? Did you, uh, ever, when you got back home after the war, did you take advantage of the GI Bill? Oh, yes. And uh, it was called On the Farm Training Program. And we had to go to high school one night a week. And I, I took that for four years. We had an instru instructor. Each one of us had an instructor. And, and then we also took courses at CSU in wiring. They had a frame of a house and we had to wire the house. And then also welding, settling, and also electric welding. And it was a wonderful experience and, and it helped me a lot on my, and then we got, well I got $200 a month, <laughs> which I think which most of the GIs got that were on the GI training either going to school or whatever. So that was that. Okay. Well, uh, any last comments before I shut it off this time? Anything else you can think of before we oh, there's close probably, down? There's probably a lot of things I think about after it's all over with, yeah. but I think we covered everything pretty well. I think so. I think it was a very well told story. So. Uh, there's always something when you're blind, uh, it's kind of hard to, I can't write anything down, you know, so I have to kind of go my memory, so, and I thank you very much. Well, you're welcome.